Um, for uh, Mr. Nissenbaum, uh, you know, we did put uh, additional uh, streamlining uh, requirement. We, we basically made rail projects eligible for uh, streamlining that we would previously adopted for, for highway projects. Um, has, the, has that been implemented yet? So we're in the process of working with uh, Federal Highways and Federal Transit to join their uh, their NEPA regulations per the, the FAST Act, and uh, that's in process, and uh, we expect that out uh, soon. Will that require rulemaking on your part? Uh, it does. It requires us to join in with the rule uh, that the, the, the Federal Highways and Federal Transit is updating right now. Okay, so you, you'll be part and parcel of that rulemaking, but that's of course right. you can't do any rulemaking right now. Well, the, not allowed to do rules. Yeah, rules are, are under the regulatory uh, review committee right now, right. but we expect uh, we expect rules like that will be moving forward. Okay, now here's a case where we're going to have a rulemaking that'll expedite projects, which so I think almost everyone would agree that's beneficial. Although some people will be concerned that there won't be adequate environmental protections, perhaps. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case. But you're going to have to find two other rules to repeal, right? I mean, if you become part of the, the highway rule and the new rule is that you have to repeal two rules to adopt a rule, even if that rule is beneficial and is streamlining, what two rules are you going to do away with? So what I can tell you is that there's support within the administration to, uh, to advance environmental streamlining. Uh, that's, this is consistent with that, uh, with that principle. Uh, and at this point, we see no reason why we can't move forward uh, full steam ahead on that. Okay. Uh, to uh, uh, President uh, Mormon, uh, the uh, the president has proposed, uh, you know, for you to focus on you know core assets or something like that, and they want to get rid of all your uh, long distance routes. And as I said in my opening remarks, that would leave many uh, communities throughout the heartland of America without either air service or rail service. Uh, is is that going to save you money if we? Uh, if we cut all those routes, and what, will it have an impact beyond those, the heartland of America? Uh, that's an excellent question in that um, while I think there's a conversation that you can have about the, the efficacy and the need of just the long distance network and the routes that we serve, uh, the true impact is more severe in that when you look at how Amtrak does its accounting uh, and look at the long distance network itself, the long distance fares, which are roughly $500 million a year, cover the fuel costs, cover the crew costs, and cover the base operation of the network, where the loss is incurred really is in the allocated cost, the cost of the reservation system for the entire network, for the, the law department, all of the SGNA. And if, in fact, the funding for the long distance network was withdrawn abruptly and we were ordered to stop it, we would lose all of the revenue. We would have significant labor protection because we, like all railroads, have labor protection in our agreements, and we would continue to incur most of our labor costs, for, which would be three to $400 million, and then all of the allocated costs that now go with the long-distance network, we would cut some, but the rest would just then go to the states, back to the state-supported business and the corridor. The net result of an abrupt change like that would we would essentially stop investing in the Northeast Corridor. We would not have the cash. Okay, uh, that's helpful. Uh, just uh, one, I mean, and Mr. Bricari, uh, your your project. Uh, I was just talking to my colleague, uh, Mr. Payne, here about what's the name of that bridge? Huh? The Portal Bridge. The Portal Bridge, and he was talking about uh, he witnessed it opening and closing, but it doesn't quite line up. So the guy gets out a sledgehammer. And uh, can, you know, are we near the point of failure on, the, on this bridge? Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, the, uh, the good news is it functions very well for a 106-year-old bridge. Uh, th but the bad news is it is 106 years old. And uh, uh, there have been operationally uh, repeated incidents uh, where it doesn't open and close successfully, which stops the entire Northeast uh, Corridor. Um, it's, that's in addition to the capacity issues. Uh, one of the design features of the new bridge that we're ready for construction on is it is high enough over the Hackensack River uh, that it does not 
have to open or close. It will be a fixed span uh, bridge. Um, yes, it is true that blunt instruments have to be used at, at times uh, to uh, make it operate. Uh, and uh, it's ironic that we're having a hearing on building a 21st century infrastructure. Uh, and it starts with, uh, in my estimation, uh, taking some early 20th century infrastructure and trying to rehabilitate it and replace it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Duncan. 